Okay, coming up on this edition of the Penn State Blitz, we're going to talk about the recent situation with Nate Bruce, Penn State's 2021 commit. We're going to get to some other news involving the 21, 2021 class. We're going to talk about some prominent former alumni in Adam Brenneman and Matt McGloin. And you know we're going to close with the Penn State mailbag. Okay, Greg, there was kind of a weird little flare-up there, recruiting flare-up over the weekend mm -hmm. with uh, one of Penn State's 2021 targets, and I believe technically still a commit, Nate Bruce, the big offensive lineman from Harrisburg High School. Uh, I want to make sure I have this straight. You're the recruiting guy, but at one point he took to Twitter on Sunday, I believe it was either late Sunday morning, early yeah. Sunday afternoon, and he said he, he had decided after careful consultation he was going to reopen his commitment. And, right. You know, that's that's up to him if he wants to do that. It's a little early in the process. It, it's, it's not the first time it's happened. It won't be the last. But then a little bit later, uh, it turned out apparently there was a clarification and he still is technically committed to James Franklin's program. Uh, can you kind of walk all of us through kind of what happened in a short period of time. Yeah, I think what really it comes down to is that there were certainly probably other schools that were interested in Nate Bruce right. and wanted the chance to talk to him, maybe host him on a visit. I mean, if you look at this kid, and you can go look at the photos that we have on Penn Live when yeah. he was just in the, the office recently with Nolan Rucci, the five-star offensive lineman out of Warwick. And, I mean, he's just a, a – Nate Bruce is a physical specimen. I mean, he looks really good. He's almost in that Fatorma Malba mode where – mold where, you know, you look at these guys and you just think they're right out of a, you know, yeah. an offensive or defensive line yeah. in a magazine. So I think some other schools were probably showing Nate interest. I also think that this is that time of year where – you look across the recruiting landscape, Bob, and a lot of guys who are uncommitted are taking visits. There's a lot of right. stuff on social media, et cetera. And that can be a hard thing to not be a part of because you're committed somewhere. So sure. I just think it really came down to the fact that he was kind of thinking about some of that stuff a little bit, maybe didn't talk to Penn State about it, uh, put out on Twitter that he was going to open things up. <laughs> and then, you know, but not too terribly long later, but then, you know, a handful of hours, yeah. Uh, puts another statement out there saying, you know, hey, look, I'm still committed to Penn State. I was listening to some outside stuff too much. Um, I don't see this as a situation that will pop up again mm -hmm. or that we'll hear later on that he decided to decommit from Penn State again, something right. like that. I do think this was a one-off um, occurrence for a guy who has been as solid as they come commitment-wise since he picked Penn State back in, I believe it was October, of right. last year so correct um you know it happens it's recruiting but uh they were able to to bat down the hatches pretty quickly and get him back in the class you know he wouldn't have been the first harrisburg high product yep to consider about to consider reopening or decommitting i don't know you're the recruiting guy a little pop quiz for you ahead of the mailbag can you name the other harrisburg high school player who committed to penn state then said mm, i'm gonna look around but ended up staying at Penn State. Yeah, I'm going to have to think about it. So if you won't mind talking for a little bit. Yeah, with Micah, it was obviously, I think, a bit of a different story. Right, um, I know. He had a ton of options and definitely committed to it. I'm not saying Nate Brute couldn't have those options if he wasn't committed to Penn State. But, yeah. you know, at this point, I don't know. We'll see. I, I just don't see this being something sure. that they have to worry about long term, as they obviously did with Micah. Okay, moving right along. More recruiting to talk about. Just the 21, 2021 class in general, just three uh, verbals, including the brother of Sean Clifford. Yeah. Uh, and they have a tight end, I think, from Florida as right. well to go with Mr. Bruce. Um, any news involving them or any news involving maybe some other players that Penn State is targeting made for that class? Yeah, you know, there's reports out there, of course, that Nick Elksness, the tight end from right. Jacksonville, visited Florida not too long ago. Again, I think... No matter who you recruit from Florida, if yeah. they pick you um, long before signing day, they're probably going to show up at either Florida, yeah. Florida State, or Miami before long. It just, it's tough when you're that far away from campus. And this goes for kids in the Midwest. This goes from kids you recruit in Texas, in the South. Um, you know, when you can't make it to the school you're committed to, but there's options mm -hmm. right down the road to go check out, even if it's just a junior day, even if it's for a game. Um, sometimes these guys will go with their friends on visits that their high school friends with or teammates in seven on seven. So, you know, is there something to worry about there? We'll see. Um, obviously, he's a guy who 
has seen his rating increase, uh, you know, since he picked Penn State. And I obviously the Southern schools would love to mm -hmm. have him as a part of their class. So it'll be a fight. And then, you know, you look at the offer action over the weekend and even in the early part of this week, uh, John Scott Jr. just spent most of Saturday offering every and any defensive lineman he had connections to right. from his time at South Carolina. I got, to, I got to talk to a few of those guys and – you know, the key now will be it's great to get in front of them with the offer. So right. much in recruiting anymore, the verbal offer is merely just a way to try and get a kid to campus. It right. might as well be an invitation. And so the next step will be getting some of those guys to, to campus. And it's a mixture of uh, recognizable names, some guys with three and four star rankings, some guys who have not picked up a ranking just yet from the recruiting services. But uh, he is clearly targeting some guys. So is Phil Troutwine. Uh, Taylor Stubblefield doing the same. So they're trying to get their ducks in a row ahead of that March opportunity to not just go see kids, but also bring guys to campus. And just real quick with Liam Clifford, in case there's some fans that are wondering, listed as an athlete, I think, in the recruiting process, I think he's a quarterback, at, and he, he plays at obviously where, where, uh, where Sean Clifford played uh, in Ohio. How does Penn State view him, or is that still playing out, or do we know? No, he's a receiver all the way, and I look at him as a guy who – will also probably get some additional interest. Now, he had a lot of it because of what he's, not only what he's done, but yep. also, um, you know, the fact that people knew know who he is, know who his parents are, his coaches are, et cetera. So he had a, some opportunities to meet some people earlier in the recruiting process than some other guys do. But he had offers and interest. He picked Penn State, obviously. He likes what they are doing. Um, of course, he picked them when Ricky Ronnie was there, when, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, Jared, Parker Jared Parker was there. Yeah. So... You know, but so far so good in terms of the, the Kirk Sharaka Taylor Stubblefield situation. So we'll see. There's a lot of concern that we see pop up uh, from the fan base in terms of, well, well other schools are getting commitments at this point. Why isn't Penn State? I, I think I understand that, Bob, but at the same time, you look at Penn State's top once, and most of them run committed at this point. And that's yeah. really all you can ask for. Top once. I like that. I like the use of that word. Halfway through. This Penn State Blitz video, Greg, you got some responsibilities to our uh, listeners uh, about maybe subscribing, giving us six, seven star ratings. So That's let's, right. Let's get to that. Yeah. So if you're watching, I guess we'll start with the YouTube videos this yeah. week, youtube.com slash all Penn State for all of our latest uh, Penn State football videos. And of course, you're looking at our new studio over at our... I mean, right? So we basically moved from uh, the distance between what the Beaver Stadium and the Bryce Jordan Center. <laughs> is that about right? And we got all these new fancy equipment to yeah. go with it. So I have a sunburn right now. Yes. In case you guys are wondering, it's a little bright in here. Please, that's fine. please send sunblock to Bob. Yeah. Um, I'm a ginger. Yes. So anyway, uh, all youtubecom slash State. Don't forget to leave uh, feedback mm -hmm. there for us. And then if you're listening to the podcast, you can find it on Apple, Spotify, Google Play. Don't forget to like, rate, subscribe, leave feedback there as well, especially on Apple. We'd appreciate it. And uh, let's roll into third down. Yeah, and I think... Uh, third and I, short or I third said, and long? Nah, we'll see. I, we're going to talk about a couple of my uh, my favorite alumni. Let's start. I think we should start. We need to start with, with Matt McGloin. Yeah. So Matt McGloin, I think, the, I think the fans know. I think you know, Greg. You know, when, when he was at Penn State and he had that phenomenal... 2012 year with Bill O'Brien. He also did some nice things before that, but you know, during during his career, he was kind of a he was a, he was a cocky guy and he wasn't afraid to speak his mind. Um, I think the fan base really loved him for it, and I think to get along with Bill O'Brien, you probably had to have a little bit of a pushback. Well, right. Uh, they he was he's uh, with the the New York franchise of the XFL. Yep. Uh, had a nice first game uh, a couple of weeks ago. Second game went horribly, horribly bad. I believe we're down 13 nothing at halftime, and as part of the XFL's, XFL's charm, um, they, they, they have some people interviewing players in the heat of the moment rather right. than giving him any time, in-game, rather than giving him any time to cool off. Uh, Matt was asked about what he thought about the first half performance, and he did not mince words. No, he basically, like, what was the word? He was the worst game plan he's ever been a part of, and they have to change the, <laughs> change the game plan at halftime. And, you know, the head coach, Kevin McBride, was kind of like... Uh, taking it back. Yeah, yeah, he didn't... Uh, he was, uh, yeah, taken aback is a good way to put it. And, I mean, he got punched in the face by Buddy Ryan, so to get him taken aback, <laughs> yeah. is, it says a lot at this point in his life. Yeah, absolutely. So that was interesting. Um, then they benched him in the second half. Well, he I believe he a, came he out a with a pick six. six. Yeah, so 
Uh, not not his greatest moment. We'll see how things play out heading into week three. But, yeah, yeah that's just kind of who Matt is. He yeah. speaks his mind. It's what made him good refreshing. as a part of uh, – It is refreshing. It's what made him good about as a part of uh, Penn State's radio broadcast. Sure. And, uh, you know, he, there's some good clips out there of him talking about John O'Neill, the referee. And that's right. Some the other Nebraska people. game. So, right. So, um, you know, that's just who he is, and it makes the XFL different from most other leagues, which is interesting, too. I mean, I know moving forward, if the New York team's on, I think everyone, Penn State fans, probably need to watch because who knows what's going to happen. Right. Next with uh, with young Matthew, let's talk about another Penn State alum, uh, Adam Brenneman. Yeah. Penn State tight end, 2013-14-15, had some knee issues. Uh, later went to briefly retired, unretired, went to UMass, became an All-American. Um, <clears throat> Adam, it, it appears, is going to take a shot at the FBS coaching ranks. Uh, Arizona State as an, there's so many weird terms anymore. He's not, he's not an assistant coach. Offensive analyst. Offensive graduate assistant. Offensive yes. graduate assistant analyst. We believe that is the case. We've heard from pretty strong sources. It's not a, quite official yet. That it's going to happen, but you know Arizona State is coached by Herm Edwards. Um, there's a lot to like about that campus and that environment. I think it's a win-win for Adam anyway. He wants to go about go about his business uh, out there. Um, it's awfully nice at this time of year and every part of the year at Arizona State. And Herm Edwards is an interesting guy. I think if Adam, you know, Greg wants to take uh, a, a real uh, make a real strong push maybe to get involved as a coach. I know he's had some other opportunities. How do you think this came about, and what do you think that the, the future kind of holds for Adam? Yeah, I mean, obviously he's sort of dabbled in all kinds of walks of life since he, he has. finished uh, his All-American career at Massachusetts. He's been in politics. He's done videos a radio with show with you, videos with you, yes. And, you know, I think he probably went to the West Coast because he was a little bit intimidated by this new studio and all these lights and everything. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I, I, I think that, um, you know, he has the right personality. I mean, you know him better than I do, but he has the right personality, temperament for coaching, I think. I mean, it's not, you know, the life of a uh, graduate assistant is by no means uh, it's a grind. glamorous. Yeah, it is certainly a grind. But, I mean, the guy mm -hmm. went from, uh, you know, overcame multiple injuries and has mm -hmm. been willing to, you know, tackle any challenge put in front of him. So it, this seems to me that if he thinks it's the right fit, obviously he does. Um, we'll wait for the official announcement, of course. But mm -hmm. uh, it's it makes a lot of sense that you know you take the best opportunity for you. Yeah. I think there's some folks out there who think Arizona State is a program that has a ch uh, chance to take a step forward this year, and uh, you never know. It only takes a couple of good years. So as we've seen mm -hmm. with not just Penn State hires, but you know, nowadays, people are more willing to hire younger guys who may have only had a year or two of experience in a GA role. And so you got to get your foot in the door somewhere, and this is it for him. Yeah, let's let's we're going to wish Adam the best of luck. I'm going to assume that this is going to go through. I, I'm sure that he he has the opportunity to, to really make some great strides and learn under uh, Herm Edwards and his staff. And on a personal note, if he does have some success, if he wants to invite me out for some golf and some other. Uh, activities. There's some. I believe there's some casinos and racetracks out there. Adam, you know, I'm I'm only just a flight away. So good luck to you, um, and Greg. Good luck to you with this Penn State mailbag. Do you like that segue? I did. Let's do it. All right. Looking at where things stand, Bob. We are about a month from spring practice, and yep. in our second video, we're going to get into some spring practice questions related Exciting. to the players. Um, but you're taking a closer look at the coaching staff right now on yeah. Penn Live, and one of the things you talked about um, recently was the receivers, yeah. Taylor Stubblefield. And I'm just curious, now that you've had some time to dive into that group more closely, who's maybe a guy that's a bit off the radar that you think could step up this year? Yeah, um, to me, I, I've, I've said it before. I mean, I really think that uh, I think that Kirk's offense is going to look a little bit different than than Ricky's offense. I think it needs to look a little bit different. Um, you and I watched, uh, I got a good look at his offense when Minnesota played, uh, Penn state and quarterback Tanner Morgan was 18 for 20 in that game. The RPOs were just very hard for Penn state's defense to defend. But the, the, the thing that people talked about the most is the quarterback got the ball out so quick mm -hmm. that, you know, Etor gross Matos shock. They, they just had no chance really to get to Tanner Morgan. And he was very accurate with the football. But as far as the wideouts go, I just look at a guy 
you know, like Jahan Dotson, who really runs good routes. He's got good hands. Yep. And not everyone on Penn State uh, can really say that, uh, especially last year. I think he is a guy that I think Kirk can really, and Taylor, can really do uh, wonders with. I think if people don't, I mean, everyone talked about, you know, K.J. Hamler, Justin Shorter. Jahan Dotson averaged 18 yards a catch last year. You know, he was actually a very good mm -hmm. player down the field and, and able to run after the catch, which is important to Penn State. I know he's <clears throat> he's an obvious pick. I really, I just really think, uh, it's just based on, I just have a very good feeling about John Dunmore, and I know I've said that before, but James talked about it at his, uh, his press conference early this year. It was technically a signing day press conference, but was also talking about the new coaching hires. They have to get all of their receivers involved in the offense, the outside receiver, you know, to the, yep. uh, to the field. Uh, kind of disappeared a little bit the last couple of years. It was strictly a lot of the boundary stuff. And that's on Sean Clifford as well. But they need their big receivers to be more integrated in the offense. It can't just be about can't just be about Pat Fryermuth and Jahan Dotson. I think Dunmore is a guy who can play outside. Daniel George sure, certainly, certainly looks the part right. of an FBS receiver. But we've we've talked about a lot of guys who have looked the part as yeah. Penn State receivers, all of them from New Jersey, and they have just not. It just has not come to fruition. Justin Shorter, Irv Charles, Saeed Blacknell, other than the Big Ten title game, Juwan Johnson even after 2017. These guys look like they should be stars. And for whatever reason, and maybe some coaching had something to do with that, Greg, yeah. they have to get more from some of their more talented, physically talented receivers. And I think that Taylor and Kirk have some very interesting players to work with. And I expect things to be a little bit different this year. True or false, the fact that Kirk Sharaka doesn't really have uh, much in his background in terms of big numbers for the tight end is something to be concerned about or something that he just hasn't had before the way it'll happen in Pat Fryermuth? Well, I don't know that he's ever had a tight end with a skill set. I'm pr not many guys uh, have. Uh, yeah. Pat Fryermuth. <laughs> I mean, you know, I just think that, I think that Kirk talked about it. He said, he just, you, you give me good players and and I can I can get the scheme going, and I can use I'll, I will utilize those big players. I, I just think that at Minnesota, <clears throat> he had, those outside receivers were so good. Uh, Rashad Bateman and Tyler Johnson. Then they had a really nice running back in Rodney Smith. They had a quarterback, and they had a big offensive line. I just think that if he had had a tight end like Pat Frymuth, you would have seen him featured as well. Um, I I don't think it's going to be a problem at all. If anything, I think you know having a guy like Pat Frymuth to be able to help as a receiver and in the run game, I mean, he's going to take some pressure off those receivers. Mm -hmm. And if some of those receivers can step up, it's going to free up Fryermuth, I think, uh, across the middle of the field. I just remember, you know, one of the things about Fryermuth is he's a really, I, he's becoming a, an all-around receiver. You look at some of the catches he made last year, the, four, the short pass he took against, uh, caught against Buffalo that was a little bit behind him. The catch and run touchdown was a big play in that game. He also... Caught a nice, pa a deep pass, I think, from Sean Clifford in the in the Michigan game. I think that opened the scoring for Penn State. He can he can hurt he can hurt a defense in a lot of different ways, and I'm I'm pretty sure that um, you know he, he he's got 15 touchdowns in two years. It's probably ridiculous to expect him to continue to produce seven or eight touchdowns a year. But I'm sure Kirk's looking at him as one of the top red zone options in the country. All right, last question for you, Bob. Tuesday, the NCAA came out with a proposal that would allow for yeah. players in, now most sports you can already do it, but men's and women's basketball, baseball, football, and there's one other one. You cannot uh, have one time free transfer. Right. You don't have to sit out a year, et cetera. They're now proposing that along with some stipulations, one of them being that a school would have to sign off on your transfer. But are you for or against the idea of each guy getting uh, yeah. one free transfer without having to sit out a year, regardless of whether he's a graduate yeah, or not? I think, I think the Big Ten and the ACC are now like firmly by it's too this major. is the, this is the Jim Harbaugh proposal this is yes. the Jim Harbaugh proposal hey look I uh, we you you watch what happened with Mel Tucker at Colorado and Michigan State how you know literally right right after signing day he bolted for Michigan State and you know what what is what's Colorado supposed to do I think I, I am for that I, I do think that a one-time transfer uh, and being able to play it immediately I think I think the way that the world is now and I think that the way that there's so much coaching movement an assistant coaching movement. I, I, I think I think the players are should be allowed and should have the freedom to get a second chance if, if they think they and they a lot of times they deserve one and to have to sit out a year. It's a pretty. I think it's a pretty. Uh, 
it's a pretty stiff penalty, and I know that more and more players are are fighting that even as we speak. But I do think, I think one exception, I think everyone gets a mulligan in life. I know on the golf course, we take a lot more mulligans. Right. But yeah, I have nothing wrong with I have nothing wrong with a second chance uh, and a fresh start for uh, for players who want one, and, and and they also have the freedom to play the next year. Mm-hmm.